We're turning to Acts chapter 17 this morning. Acts chapter 17. We are marching with Paul and his companions through the book of Acts. And we're seeing the great work that our Savior did through his servants. And this morning as we consider the first 15 verses of Acts chapter 17, we will look at the title, God's Nobles. God's Nobles. And as let's prepare our hearts by going to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you this morning for your blessing here. Thank you for the wonderful hymns we have sung. Thank you for the uh, ministry and music. And thank you, Father, for the remembrance of our Savior's death until he comes. And this morning, we, would, we look forward to that return right now. It would be so awesome if he would come back today. It would be glorious. But realize until that moment comes, there's, there's much to do. There are souls all around us that are lost and dying in their sins. And we care about them. We pray for them. We witness to them. And we ask for your help to win them to a saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. We're up against an unbelievable enemy today. Uh, the Satan is pulling out all his stops against the saints all over the earth. And so we pray against him. We pray against his minions. We pray this morning that you will rule on this earth right now, that you will rule in our hearts. We ask that you might speak to us through these scriptures we look at today. Uh, mold us into the image of thy son. Uh, we ask that we will leave your house today better equipped, better prepared to serve in these days. And we know that is, it, that is possible because you can make that happen as we yield ourselves to you, as we believe in you, as we trust and depend that your word is so. It is the truth. I ask you, Holy Spirit, to fill me now for the message. I trust and depend in you for that. You speak to our hearts. Guide every phrase, every word. We ask that we would grow together in Jesus Christ this morning. We ask this all in Jesus' precious name. Amen. God's nobles from Acts chapter 17. Many believe that the Apostle Paul stands as the number one prince or noble of the church. I'm one of those that believe that. I'm sure there are many here that are like that as well. The noblest servant in the church. What does that mean to be God's noble? It means that Paul possessed the very highest and most excellent qualities in his life. And we can be like that as well this morning as his children. Paul's famous words in Philippians 3.10 are forceful and powerful. That I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. Paul was very brave and he was very determined. The 2 Corinthians 11 list of his sufferings literally blows our minds. It's hard to even get through that list without just stopping and contemplating all the things that he suffered for the cause of Christ. He wore the scars of ministry on his face and on his back. The many times that he received the lashes with rods, punched, abused, shipwrecked, stoned. Wow. He loved souls so much that nothing could stop him. Nothing could stop him. His intelligence was incredible. His writings are very reasoned. 1 Corinthians 13 is very lyrical. He had massive passion for the Lord Jesus Christ. That's something that we all should pray that we can really get a hold of in our own lives. To have that passion for the Lord Jesus Christ that Paul had. He was putting everything he had into living for Jesus Christ. Everything was about living for 
the Lord Jesus Christ. He was alive as could be. John Powell in his book entitled Fully Alive says this, quote, Fully alive people are those who are using all of their human faculties, powers, and talents. They are using them to the full. These individuals are fully functioning in their external and internal sources. They are comfortable with and open to the full experience and expression of all human emotions. Such people are vibrantly alive in mind, heart, and will. There is an instinctive fear in most of us, I think, to travel with our engines at full throttle. We prefer, for the sake of safety, to take life in small and dainty doses. Are you like that this morning? Got to get rid of that fear. We got we to gotta go full throttle. You know, there's some young men here this morning, and I'm sure that quite recently they have put the pedal to the metal. What a thrill that is. And that can be that thrill in our Christian life if we will give it full throttle for the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, Paul was fully alive and then some. He was amazing. And so here he is, and, and we can learn from his life the secrets of that noble life that he lived and his missionary team. The team leaves Philippi. We were just in Philippi. Great things happened there. And, and they're saying goodbye to this new church. And that church in Philippi, did they have a good start or what? I mean, they started with gangbusters. I mean, it was, there was persecution and there was a saving of so many souls. We had Lydia, her household, the jailer and his household, the ex-Pythonists, and many more. And so they say their goodbyes to them. And their next stop is Thessalonica. And they get there, and according to verse number one, they even had a synagogue there. Some places did not. So in verse one of Acts 17, now when they had passed through Amphilippus and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where was a synagogue of the Jews. Remember what you had to have in order to form a synagogue, you had to have 10 Jewish men. So in Thessalonica, they had that. And so here they are, a three-day, 100-mile trip to this thriving city. Look at verses 2 and 3. And Paul, as his manner was, went in unto them, and three Sabbath days, notice, reasoned with them out of the Scriptures, opening and alleging that Christ must needs have suffered and risen again from the dead, and that this Jesus, whom I preach unto you, is Christ. So Paul's ministry here in Thessalonica has three steps, three things that he did there. Number one, he reasoned with the Jews from the Scriptures. He dialogued with them. They had times of questioning and answers. There was an exchange. And then number two, he explained the meaning of the scriptures. He opened it up so that they could see it. He did this very simply and clearly. Simplicity is very good. You do not have to be super polished. You don't have to have some great big speech to share Christ. The simpler, the better. People don't know, so be simple. A freshman a Bible college student heard the great George W. Truett preach, and he said, huh, he didn't even use one word that I didn't understand. So for him, I guess great preachers got to use those big words. No, no, no. Simplicity saves an awful lot of confusion. And then the third thing that Paul did was he set before them the evidence. He proved his case. He preached to lead the people to a verdict. Now notice, what did Paul do? He went there three Sabbaths in a row. He kept it up. 
He kept preaching. He kept dialoguing. He kept sharing. The verdict he wanting them to come to is that Jesus Christ is the Messiah. He had to suffer. He had to die. He rose again from the dead. This Jesus is your Messiah. This is what you Jews need to get. And so he treats the people with respect. He treats them with dignity. He didn't ask them to believe his opinions. Not at all. It all came from the scriptures. The gospel will stand on its own. You give that person a few salvation verses. You give that person a few verses of assurance. Those words of the Bible stand on their own. They always will. They will not return void. And then what happens? People will either receive it or they will reject it. And what we as believers need to, to remember in our own hearts and get pounded in there, don't worry about them rejecting it. It's okay. Most people do. Most people will. Give it anyhow. Somewhere along the line, someone else will share. They will come and they will believe. So Paul's continuing to teach would sometimes cost him. There would be opposition. There would be even persecution. We are well aware this morning that there are born-again believers in Afghanistan who probably have died in the past week, who have been probably brutally murdered. But what are they doing in Afghanistan as believers? What have they said that they will do anyhow? They said, yes, we may die, but we will until that day. We will go house to house and we will share the Lord Jesus Christ. And they've been winning souls. People are coming to know Christ as their savior the, this missionary team they ministered and they also worked to support themselves in those days paul had a tent business he mended them and he made them he was a tent expert and in time jews and a lot of gentiles believed including a number of prominent women look at verse number four and some of them believed and consorted with Paul and Silas, and of the devout Greeks, a great multitude, and of the chief women, not a few. They had a great start in Thessalonica. Things are going well. Now, we've been with Paul on his journeys, right? We're coming along. Whenever something is going really well, what happens? persecution trouble opposition things are going well and as usual trouble is right around the corner that brings us to point number one this morning the prince and the ignoble the prince and the ignoble who are the ignoble they are the people who are not honorable in character. They are the base people. They're the lowlifes. They are the mean people. They are vile. And that's what is going to happen here. He's going to run up against these individuals. Look at verses 5 through 9. But the Jews, which believed not, moved with envy, took unto them certain lewd fellows of the baser sort the ignoble and gathered a company and set all the city on an uproar and assaulted the house of jason and sought to bring them out to the people and when they found them not they drew jason and certain brethren unto the rulers of the city crying these that have turned the world upside down are come here also whom jason he has received them and these all do contrary to the decrees of Caesar, saying that there is another king, one Jesus. And they troubled the people and the rulers of the city when they heard these things. And when they had taken security of Jason and the others, the other believers, they let them go. Here we go again. A number 
of Jews who rejected the gospel went to the town people, the square, gathered a mob, a bunch of bums. They get this uproar going. They're looking for Paul and Silas at the home of Jason, but they're not there. Oh, wasn't that? That worked out good. That worked out real good this time. They went there, but the missionaries were not there. They dragged Jason and some other believers before the city officials. And these thugs are basically saying, these people have turned our world upside down. You betcha. Mm-hmm. Yes, that's, what is it, that's exactly what they did. But the world was already upside down due to the fall, and it's been that way ever since. The truth is, however, that only believers live right side up. Only believers live right side up in a messed up world. Paul and company would have loved to stay there longer to build these believers in the faith, but now God is going to send them to a much nobler people. The next stop is going to be one of the best stops ever, a place called Berea. Point number two, the prince and the noble. The prince and the noble. Let's look at verses 10 through 15. And the brethren immediately sent away Paul and Silas by night unto Berea, who coming thither went into the synagogue of the Jews. These were more noble than those in Thessalonica, in that they received the word with all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily, whether those things were so. Therefore many of them believed, also of honorable women which were Greeks, and of men not a few. But when the Jews of Thessalonica had knowledge that the word of God was preached of Paul at Berea, they came thither also, and stirred up the people. And then immediately the brethren sent away Paul to go, as it were, to the sea. But Silas and Timotheus abode there still. And they that conducted Paul brought him unto Athens, and receiving a commandment unto Silas and Timotheus, for to come to him with all speed they departed. The prince and the noble... We might guess that these people here in Berea were more noble because they were not with the big city, with all the big city vices. But that's really not it. The scriptures have the answer in verse number 11. These were more noble than those in the Thessalonica in that they received the word with all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily whether those things were so. Their eagerness to receive the word has an, the idea of rushing forward. Now, this is, this is every soul winner's dream. Going to a place like Berea, where you give the gospel and they receive it. Once and done. And here it is. A glorious new church is begun. Oh, what a time that is. That is a soul winner's dream. And not only that, they were, what were they doing? Remember uh, about, oh, 12, 15 years ago, we had a, bio, a VBS and it had uh, uh, the, uh, the Western scene with the hats and we had the uh, wagons that we made sitting around in here and all that Western gear. And, and one of the songs said this, they were, we are to dig, dig, dig for the truth in the word of God. I never forgot that little ditty from that vacation Bible school. They were dig, dig, digging for the truth in the word of God. That's what they were doing in Berea. They didn't just hear, they didn't just receive, they got into the scriptures themselves and they were dig, dig, digging for the truth in the word of God. George Mueller, a, a, a great man of God, a, a man of prayer that, that got what he prayed for I think I understand one of the reasons. I didn't know this before, but he read the Bible over 200 times in his lifetime. 
Now I'll say this, I'm way behind. 200 times. That's a lot. Well, the truth is we should all be dig, dig, digging for the truth in the word of God. We don't just come and listen, we dig. We have to go home and we have to dig, dig, dig for the truth. Read, compare, meditate. The Bereans were more noble because they searched the Bible every day. This wasn't what they picked up on Sunday morning and carried to church. They were in that every day of the week. Why were they in there? I want to find out if this guy Paul is telling us the truth. You see, you need to go home uh, today and, and look at this and say, I wonder if Pastor Mayor is telling me the truth here. One thing you do know, if it's my opinion, I will tell you up front. <laughs> That's my opinion. He is looking. Paul said what was the truth, and they went home and dug it out for themselves. We cannot accept teachings without discernment. That's what's happening today in this country. This is what's been happening. Cannot accept teachings without discernment. That's a very, very bad habit. Fast food spiritually is literally spiritually unhealthy. We talk about the fast food that we eat not being good for us. I've heard someone say if you want to go to fast food that's actually somewhat good for you, go to Wendy's. They say that's the best fast food. I don't know. So somebody said. But fast food spiritually is very unhealthy. Very unhealthy. Hence, we need a powerful revival in the church in America. I forget what the number was. Matt sent me a, a text about how many Christians in America between certain ages, and they're usually mostly on the younger side, believe that there's more than one way to heaven. People who say they're saved, he's looking for it right now. Over 60% will agree that there's more than one way to heaven. Now, what is the answer to that? No, there is not. There is one way. John 14, 6, Kurt's calling out back there in that low, deep voice. I am the door. That's the only door there is. There's no other way. We need a revival in this country, in the church. You and I, we must examine, we must dig, dig, dig. We must dig for ourselves. The Bereans listened very, very carefully. You know, the Christian life is incredible if we're open to continuous learning and growth. Continually dedicating ourselves to drink in the scriptures, to dig it out for ourselves. What was the outcome in Berea? The outcome was multitudes of people came to know Jesus Christ as their Savior. A nobility was born in Berea. Look at verse number 12 one more time. Therefore, many of them believed, also of honorable women, which were Greeks, and of men, not a few. That was a great day in Berea. Mm. The word of God came alive. And these Bereans rushed to taste of the scriptures. And it satisfied their souls. I want to leave you finally this morning with an account from a pastor's life. It kind of brings all of this together and shows how this, how this works. A pastor was in a nice restaurant one day and the waitress came over to his table and he said, Have you made the wonderful discovery of knowing Christ personally? Write that down. That is a good one-liner. Have you made the wonderful discovery of knowing Christ personally? 
personally. In the conversation, she indicated she had not and began making excuses. She, oh, I can't go to church on Sunday because I work. I would be more comfortable with a Bible in my own language, Romanian, and so on. So there were not very many people in the restaurant, so the pastor reached in his pocket for a copy of the tract, Four Steps for Peace with God. But he discovered he didn't have any. They were all gone. So he took a napkin off the table and wrote out the steps and gave it to her. He went on his way, but later dropped off a Romanian Bible for her. At a later date, he came back to the restaurant, and now it's really busy in there. Across the restaurant, the waitress saw him coming. The waitress saw him coming and rushed over to tell him that she was reading the Bible. In fact, she had sometimes read it all night long. Better yet, she came to know Christ as her Savior. Now get this. She then pulled that napkin out of her pocket, now in tatters, and said, Would you write that down for me again? I have showed this so many times. My napkin is coming apart. You know what that is? That's the power of the Word of God. That is the power of of the word of God. And what did it do? It turned another life right side up. It turned another life right side up. Let us pray. Our dear Heavenly Father, help us this morning to understand who we are. We are your nobles here this morning. We are your children. We are your royalty. Please help us to maintain behavior in keeping with who we are. Grant us a continuing hunger for spiritual truth. Make us thirsty for your precious scriptures. Deliver us from accepting teaching about you without examining the Bible ourselves to see if it is so. Please help us this morning. Please help us, your children, who, are, who easily stray and misunderstand. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.